have a terrifying secret is it is it the fact that they play Fortnite? is is that it i mean it <laughs> well it's not really a secret nowadays uh i've been going to to schools around here and i've been giving speeches to kids about being a youtuber as a matter of fact i'm gonna probably be giving one here sometime this week i can't remember uh when my sister told me about it but I'm going to be giving a speech to a bunch of kids, and those kids, hopefully, are going to hear what I say and take it to heart. And I've been telling them mainly, like, if someone like me can be successful on YouTube, then there is literally nothing stopping you from being a success on YouTube. It does take hard work, but I would say the biggest things that, the biggest advantage that this generation has, and I told a bunch of kids, I'm like, I was like, all right, kids. How many of you all here have smartphones? Every single one of their hands went up. And I'm like, see, you already have an advantage over my generation. We didn't have these. We didn't have these to, you know, make content on and make, make shorts and everything on. And it takes work for you to really build your audience. But if you find something that works, find something that your audience gravitates towards you on, then run with it and, and see where it goes from there. That's basically what I had to tell them. But a lot of those kids are just, like, so uh, easy to inspire and all that. And it Also, there's some kids that I've ran into that are very, uh, have a very, like, dark uh, way about that. Yeah, it's sort of like, you can see it as them being edgy. Because, you know, they're, when you're younger, you know, you, you, there's some go through an edgelord phase where they say stuff and everything. And one kid did that with me. One kid basically was just like, like, <laughs> it was like, hey, does uh, being a YouTuber come with a weight loss plan? <laughs> and I'm just like, kid, the only thing fat on me is my wallet. And if you want to have one too, I suggest you listen. And he 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 was just like, whatever. It was like, you know, just sitting in the back of the class. And they give us these notes at the end of the day. Uh, they like write us a letter and everything. And he wrote his, and he. He wasn't really allowed to say anything derogatory, you know, like, you suck, you're horrible. It's just, he was just like, he just wrote, thanks for coming, and then didn't even bother to sign his name. Like, you're welcome, kid. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that kid's got problems. Maybe he's going through some stuff at home. I don't know. I'm not one to judge. But kids can, like, teens can carry secrets sometimes and sometimes it's very very dangerous secrets that some of these kids can hold and uh mr ballin has a video here about some kids that have some terrifying secrets so i guess uh let's go ahead and check out what mr allen has to say mr john b allen let's uh take a look and see here we go Today's story has a very distressing and graphic plot twist at the end, and so viewer discretion is advised. But before we get into today's story, if you're Isn't a fan that usually of the strange, case? dark, and yeah, mysterious usually. <laughs> story format, then you come to the right place. Welcome to Mr. Ballin. And we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please tell the like button you're going to upload on your YouTube channel three, four, even five times every week, and then knock it down to three or four times a week, and then knock two, three times a week, then and once then one a week. or two times a week. And then go ahead and just don't post for three weeks straight. Also, please oh, he ain't got to do that. And turn no, <laughs> I, I can't do that. No, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't post two or three times a day. I po Well, we actually can kind of do. We post two or three times a day. Yeah, usually. With the, the anime uh, reactions and all that. But, yeah, we um, can't really do that, John. I mean, I mean I'd, I'd like to be to where I could post like one video a week and make enough money off that. Uh, I know Russian Badger works his ass off on every video, and whenever those videos get demonetized or age gated, it pisses me off as much. I would not going to say as much as him, but it pisses me off as well because of the hard work that he puts into his videos, mm -hmm. going to waste like that. But 
I'm always appreciative of John, of uh, Mr. Ballin's uh, videos and everything. So, uh, yeah, hopefully his videos m don't get age gated or or uh, taken down or you know demonetized that much. Turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Yeah, actually, we got flagged for this theme. I don't. Really? Yeah, I don't know why because I looked it up and the dude said that it's royalty free as long as you attribute his name. And it's like I do. I attribute it in the in the uh, description, just like he says. Anyway, sorry. Strange. It is strange. I don't know why. But oh well, it is what it is. Morgantown, West Virginia is this beautiful oh. place nestled well, that's at the close. bottom yeah. of this huge mountain range called the Green Mountains. It is a big time college town as the famous West Virginia University is located yeah. there. And so during the school year, I've been the to that. I've been to that university. People. And during the football season, the town is absolutely buzzing with freaking mountaineers. But dude. the college is not the only reason people live in Morgantown. Lots of families choose to live there because there's so much to do year round. Also, it's relatively safe. And in general, it's an up and coming place with new shops and restaurants and museums popping up every single year. But despite all of that, Morgantown is also known for something absolutely terrible. Pills. And that is the story of Skylar Nice. In 2012, <laughs> what am I wrong? I don't know. I mean, dude, <laughs> haven't like, been there. That's, that's this whole area, though. Yeah, most like, of the from, South has that like, problem. Oh, not just that, dude. All the way up to Pennsylvania, down to like down all the way throughout the South, oh, Florida. Pillbilly and a meth head problem in the South for sure. Yes, pillbillies are are everywhere, dude, and I I run into them more often than not. Jesus. 16-year-old Skylar Niece was a sophomore in high school in Morgantown, West Virginia. She was a straight-A student, and she worked part-time at a Wendy's, which is a fast food restaurant chain. And by all accounts, she was extremely well-liked by her peers, her co-workers, and had many, many friends. She was the only nice. child of Mary and David Niece, and they absolutely mm. adored her. David, in particular, who was this big, burly man's man, he said that he spoiled his daughter rotten. The parents would say their daughter was full of love and life and she was fiercely loyal and at times she could be absolutely hilarious. One of Dave's fondest memories is when Skylar was a very young girl, he was home taking care of her by himself. And that morning, as he's looking after her, she asks him if he will participate in one of her trademark tea parties. And so David, the ever dutiful father, walks over and says, of course, I'll participate in your tea party. And he sits down in this little tiny pink chair and his daughter, who's got her ballerina tutu on, she's across the table and she's all smiles. And she sits down in her little pink chair and she hands him this little plastic teacup. And so he takes the teacup and he sees there's water yeah. on the side of it. And so he sips the tea inside of the cup and he says, oh, it's so good. Get Honey, that pinky you did up. such a good job brewing this tea. And Skylar is just blushing. She is so happy and so thrilled that he liked her tea. Later that night, when Mary came home from work, she goes to her husband, Dave, and says, hey, how did it go? How was it looking after Skylar today? And Dave would tell her about all the things they did, including their big tea party. And mm. he would tell Mary that, you know, this time she actually put water inside of the teacup. So it was actually like a real tea party. And Mary stops him and goes, Dave, Skylar's not tall enough to reach the faucet. How could she have put water inside of those cups? And it turned out Skylar was using toilet water to fill oh! the And on the night of July. <laughs> oh, God oh damn you it. little scamp. <laughs> Fifth, 16 year old Skylar niece had just finished a night shift at the Wendy's restaurant and she just got home. She walks through the front door of her family's apartment. And as soon as she gets inside, she tells her parents she's really tired. She wants to go to bed. And so she hugged both of her parents. She told them that she loved them. And then Mary and Dave watched their daughter walk down the first floor hallway. And then they watched her open her bedroom door, go inside and shut it behind her. The following morning, Mary and Dave both had to work, so they were up early, and Skylar was not up. She was still in her bedroom, her door was still shut, and so they assumed she was just going to sleep in. And so Mary and Dave, they make breakfast, they're chatting, they're kind of doing their morning routine, and then when it was time to go to work, they decided, you know, let's not bother Skylar, she worked late last night, you know, let her sleep in. 
And so the parents, they leave without seeing or talking to their daughter. Later that afternoon, yeah, Dave crap. would come home early from work and he gets to the apartment, he goes inside and it's quiet. Now, Mary was still at work, but Skylar at this point really should not have been asleep. It's like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. And so he's thinking, you know, she's gotta be up around here somewhere. And so he yells out to his daughter, you know, hey, I'm home, you know, where are you? What are you up to? But there was no response, it was just silent. And so he walked down the first floor hallway towards his daughter's bedroom and he saw the door was still shut. Now she only kept that door shut when she was sleeping. And so he's thinking, okay, I guess she must still be asleep. This is really late in the afternoon. So, you know, I'm gonna knock on the door and see if she's okay. And so he knocks on the door and says, hey, Sky, you know, it's late in the afternoon, you gotta get up. But there was no answer. And when he listened to the door, there was no noise coming from the bedroom. And so he thought that was pretty weird. And so he knocked a few more times. He yelled out a few more times. And when there was no response, no answer, no sound, he opened the door up. And when he looked inside, Skylar was not in there. Now, Dave was thinking to himself, I don't think my daughter told me that she would be gone today, or at least not right now. And he's trying to think, you know, did she say something? Was she meeting someone today? And he couldn't think of it. And so he just pulled his phone out and he called his daughter, but she didn't pick up. So he called his wife, Mary, and Mary's at work and Mary picks up and Dave asked her, you know, hey, have you seen Skylar or do you know where she is right now? And she would say, no, I, I don't know where she is. Maybe she's out with one of her friends. And so after Dave hung up the phone with his wife, he wound up calling one of Skylar's very closest friends. Her name was Sheila and she had known Skylar since they were in second grade. They were practically inseparable and he had a good relationship with Sheila. And so he just calls Sheila and he says, hey, you know, I haven't seen Skylar she's gone right now do you know where she is and Sheila would say no I'm sorry I don't but I did talk to her last night but you know there was nothing unusual about our interaction it was just normal texting about you know normal stuff yeah and so Dave said okay thank you typical well, teen you know, girl could, shit. can you please try to get in touch with Skylar and if you do get in touch with her please tell her to get in touch with us or if you hear anything about her please just let me know after Dave hung up the phone with Sheila he kind of stopped and just looked around his daughter's bedroom and thought you know maybe there's some clue in here about where she's gone and at first glance really nothing seemed out of the ordinary but when he walked around her bed and was looking inside of her closet he saw the mesh screen that should have been mounted on the outside of her window was in her closet and he's thinking you know why is that in there there's no reason for it to be in the closet and so instinctively he just turns around and walks over to the window that this screen is supposed to be on and when he looks down at the bottom of the window he sees it's open barely just enough where you could maybe get your fingernails underneath the window and pry it open and so dave reaches down and opens this window all the way and because there was no screen on this window he just stuck his head all the way out the window so his head is outside of the apartment he's just kind of looking around looking for some explanation of why this screen had been removed and put in her closet and he got his explanation when he looked straight down and saw on the grass outside, just several feet below this window, because this is a first floor window, there was a bench and the bench clearly had been moved there recently. For Dave, even though he had never heard of his daughter sneaking out of the house before and really didn't think that was something she would do, he's looking around thinking, okay, you know, the evidence in her room and now outside of her room really indicates that she that is exactly out. what she must have done the night before. She must have snuck out. But as he's processing this, he's also thinking, okay, well, if she snuck out of the house last night and then, you know, snuck back into her room, why didn't she replace the screen on the window? And why didn't she close the window all the way? And then this morning before she left to go wherever she went, why didn't she go outside and move the bench from under her window back to where it was supposed to go? To So logically he's putting it together. It's just like, did she come back last night? Mm -hmm. And the logic in my mind from everything that Ballin is saying here, she didn't. I'm actually starting to wonder if she actually snuck out, too, or if someone didn't break into her room through the window and kidnap her. Maybe. I don't know, but the screens being removed off of it, it's very difficult to remove the screens from the outside. Those are typically removed from the inside because the little pull tabs on them are, uh, you know, they're little metal things that go into the window uh, yeah, window face. I, I would say... She would have had to have removed them herself. To avoid suspicion. Why didn't she do that? And then it dawns on him that his daughter must have snuck out the night before, but not come back yet. She's still out wherever she went. Dave was very concerned. However, he's thinking maybe there's a better explanation. Maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. I'm going to show my kids. 
if I ever have kids, Mr. Ballin' videos to scare them into not sneaking out of the house and shit. <laughs> it's like, why are we watching this, Dad? Because it's an interesting story. Just it's like, it's keep like watching. sit back, kids, and we and I want you to learn something. And it's just like looking over at them, you see that they're scared, and it's just like, are you gonna sneak out of your room ever again? No. <laughs> Good. Or just, I mean, even if they don't sneak out at all, like, you know, I'm still going to show it to them anyway, just to be like, you know, so they never get the idea. And if they ever, if their stupid little friends ever give them the idea, you know, they'll hopefully just be like, fuck no. Like, hell no. Like, I don't want to be murdered. I'm not sneaking <laughs> out. Uh, and so he calls his wife to kind of I just snuck talk out a few her times. and figure out what they snuck do. Snuck out once. And they decide, you know what, this is concerning, but let's just give her a couple of hours to turn back up again. I'm sure she's fine. And so they begin to wait, and then at 4 p.m. that evening, Wendy's, the restaurant where Skylar worked, called Dave and said, hey, have you seen Skylar? She was supposed to work today, and she didn't show up, she didn't call. It's very unlike her, you know, what's going on? And this was the tipping point. Dave and Mary knew something had to be wrong. Yeah. And so Dave called the police. Mark County 911, do you have an emergency? I have a 16 year old daughter who apparently snuck out of her room last night. She has not been home, hasn't went to work, can't get a hold of her from any of her friends. I am scared to death. Has she done this before? Um, no. After Dave got off the phone, he and his wife began kind of frantically Damn. figuring out what they should do. You know, while the police are out looking, you know, should we go out and look too? Or should we stay here in case she comes home and, you know, maybe she's hurt. Maybe we can help her if she gets here. And so they're having this really difficult and stressful conversation when Mary's phone rings and it's Sheila. And so Mary immediately answers it, hoping for some good news about her daughter. But Sheila asks Mary right away, you know, hey, has Skylar come home yet? And Mary says, no, she hasn't. And in fact, we just got off the phone with the police because this doesn't make sense. Something's wrong and we're getting the police involved. And so when Sheila hears this, she kind of takes a deep breath. And then after a little bit of a hesitation, she says, Mary, I gotta tell you the truth about last night. She would go on to explain that the night before, Skylar had snuck out of the house. And so had she, along with their other very close friend named Rachel. And Rachel was someone that Mary and Dave also knew very, very well. The three girls were kind of like best friends and totally inseparable. And so Sheila said the three of them snuck out. And in fact, they did this a lot and they would drive around town and smoke marijuana together. But this was not mm. the big reveal. Despite this being fairly shocking to Mary and Dave, this was not the big reveal. The big reveal was that when they went out and snuck out of their houses and smoked weed together, they would make sure they never drove their car. Whoever was driving would never drive directly in front of any of their houses because they were concerned that the noise from the car could wake up parents and then they'd get caught. And so the way they would do it is after they snuck out of their house, they would walk a block or two away from their house and then they would call or text the other two and they'd get yeah. picked up and they'd go do their thing. And then when they got dropped off, they would get dropped off a block or two away from their home and then walk the rest of the way. And so mm. Sheila told Mary yeah. that last night, like so many other nights, she dropped Skylar off about a block away from their apartment and then Sheila and Rachel drove off. So they did not actually see Skylar enter her apartment. So they don't know for sure if she actually made it home okay. Yeah, I... I always, whenever I called my friends and told them, hey, you know, uh, I'll meet you down at the uh, down at the end of the street. That way, you know, it won't risk waking my mom. Which, at that point, my mom was, my mom was, you know, not in her best sorts to look after me that much. And I was able to get away with a, a few times getting away with it. But mostly I would tell my mom, like, hey, I'm going to be out. And, uh, no, I, like, do I have a curfew or anything? And she, she'd be like, just be back by this time. I'm like, okay. And I would usually break curfew, like hanging out with my friends, because my, my older friend, he had a he had a car, and we all just drove around and, you know, just hung out and just did normal things, you know, what kids typically do. You know how it is. 
And so this was obviously horrifying for Mary and Dave to hear because it totally opened the door for their daughter to have been abducted during this walk from the drop-off point back to her apartment. And the street she was on was not well lit. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. She's potentially high on marijuana. And so it seemed like that was a very realistic thing that could have happened, as horrifying as it sounded. And so after Mary got off the phone with Sheila, she called the police and she updated them about what Sheila had told her. And then Mary and Dave met up with Sheila and Sheila's mother and began searching the immediate area around their apartment in hopes that maybe, you know, she fell somewhere and she's trapped and she just needs to be picked up or helped in some way. But after searching for several hours and knocking on dozens and dozens of doors, nobody saw anything, nobody knew anything, there was no sign of Skylar. And so as this group is totally down, they don't know what to do, they feel totally helpless, they know the police are out looking for Skylar, but they want to do something and they just, they don't know what to do. And that's when Mary remembers there is a security camera on the outside of their apartment building that is looking down at the road. And so right away, the four of them literally run back to the apartment building, they go inside, they find the security manager, they explain the situation, and sure enough, he pulls up the footage from the night before, and the footage they see doesn't make sense. Sheila had dropped Skylar off on that corner, kind of out of view of the camera, at around midnight. But at 12.30, so 30 minutes after she's been dropped off, you see this unknown kind of generic looking car pull up right in front of the apartment complex. And then Skylar comes running across the lawn, goes right up to the car, opens the back door, hops in the back seat, shuts it, and the car drives off. Even though this did not solve the mystery of where their daughter was, because they had no idea what car this was, who was driving it, or where they were going, Mary and Dave still felt relieved, because from their perspective, it seemed like their daughter had willingly got into this vehicle, whoever it was. Whatever they were doing, she had gotten in on purpose, which meant she probably was not being abducted, which was their big fear. Over the next couple of days, the police analyzed this footage and tried to get information about this car, but the footage was so grainy, they couldn't do it. However, the police were telling Dave and Mary, you know, hey guys, you know, I'm sure Skylar is gonna show up any day now, you know, as much as you may not wanna believe it, that your daughter is capable of running away, it is fairly common for teens to do that. They'll run away and then, you know, a couple of days later, they'll pop back up. And so I'm sure that's what's going on with Skylar. You know, she chose to get in that car. And so I'm sure she will choose to get back in touch when she feels comfortable. So a couple of days go by and the parents haven't heard anything from their daughter. And then a couple of weeks go by, still nothing. And then a couple of months go by, still nothing. And this is all despite the fact that there is a massive search happening led by the police and locals in Morgantown have put flyers up everywhere that have pictures of Skylar Niece's face everywhere in town and in neighboring towns it was like you could not go five feet without being reminded that this girl is missing have you seen her if you have give us information despite the amount of publicity this case was getting no one came forward with any meaningful information it was like Skylar had just vanished and no one had a clue what happened to her her parents were obviously devastated that they had no idea what happened to her but they were kind of holding on to this idea that, you know, maybe she did run away and maybe she will eventually be in touch with us. But by December of that year, so six months after Skylar had gone missing, Damn. no one had heard from her, no one had Damn, seen her, no one had any idea where she was, there was no new leads. And so people were starting to feel less and less optimistic and the case was starting to kind of go cold. And then on December 12th, something totally unexpected happened that changed everything. On that night, Rachel, the other friend who had been there with Sheila, Sheila and with Skylar on the night that Skylar had vanished, she has a full-blown nervous breakdown. In fact, it's so bad that she's screaming and running around and she's punching her family members and her mom actually calls the police on her. I have an issue with a 16-year-old daughter of mine. I can't control her anymore. She's screaming, she's running through the neighborhood. Give me the phone. No, this is over, this is over. Hurry up. After this call was made, the police show up to Rachel's house and they take her away to a psychiatric hospital. And then several days later, when she was released from that hospital, she went straight to the Morgantown Police Department. She walked inside 
and said, I gotta get something off my chest about Skylar. Mm -hmm. Apparently, whatever it was that she had been keeping secret Damn. had just been too difficult to keep inside. It was quite literally driving her crazy. And so the police said, okay, great. And they brought her into an interview room, they sat down and they said, okay, what do you got for us? The following has been pulled from what Rachel told police. Back on July 5th, 2012, Skylar came home from that night shift at Wendy's. She goes inside her family's apartment. She says good night to her mom and dad. She goes into her bedroom and she shuts the door and she's laying on her bed. She's on her phone. She's not going to bed quite yet. And as she's laying there, she starts getting text messages from Rachel and also from Sheila asking her if she wants to sneak out that night. Now, uh, Skylar didn't want to, and she said as much because she was actually hurting. She was mad at her two friends. According to some of her other friends that went to school with her and Rachel and Sheila, the three of them were totally inseparable, but lately, kind of the few months leading up to when she ultimately disappeared, there had been tension in their group. It seemed like Sheila and Rachel were getting very, very close and kind of pushing Skylar away, and Skylar was starting to pick up on it. It was little things, like Sheila and Rachel would show up to school in matching outfits, but they wouldn't tell Skylar beforehand, kind of leaving her out. Mm. Or whenever they posted selfies of the three of them, Skylar was always relegated to the back or kind of in some other way obscured to make sure she was not the focal point of the picture. It was just very obvious that they were deprioritizing Skylar and it was really hurting Skylar's feelings. And so it seemed like her way of standing up to them and kind of telling them that she was upset was to turn down their offer of sneaking out and smoking weed with them. But over the next couple of hours, Skylar would eventually say, okay, fine, you know, I'll come with you guys, I'll sneak out and, and we'll go smoke together. Just before 12.30 a.m. on July 6th, Skylar gets off of her bed, she walks over to her window, she lifts it up, and she pulls the screen off, and she walks over to her closet, she puts the screen in her closet and shuts the door to the closet, and then she walks back over to the window and crawls out, and lowers herself down onto the grass below, and then she walks over and grabs the bench and slides it over and puts it right underneath her window, and then she stands on the bench and reaches up and pulls the window down so there's just a little crack left so she can get back inside, and then she just waited by the side of the apartment looking out towards the road and right after 12 30 this car the unknown car on the surveillance camera pulls right in front of the apartment building and skylar runs over to it opens up the back right door oh. and climbs inside dang it dang old internet man uh, why why do you do this internet being stupid again sorry everybody yep there it is I'll switch, see if I can't switch like the thing on here. Damn. Come on. <laughs> ah, there we go. Oh, Hi. there we go. Okay. So we are connected again and building and Skylar runs over to it, opens up the back right door and climbs inside. This unknown car was Sheila's car. Sheila was driving and Rachel was in the front passenger seat. It would turn out Rachel and Sheila lied about basically everything, including what time they picked up Skylar. So the three girls, they drive away from Skylar's apartment and Sheila hops on a highway and starts driving northwest. Now, the girls did not immediately start smoking inside of the car. They decided instead they would actually drive to a location, get out and That's smoke Some pretty there. shitty and police the detective work to not be able to figure out that that car in the before. video belonged to her fucking friend. Yeah. Like, that is some fucking ass detective work. I know it was grainy, but me and you could look at that car in the video. And be like, that's a Toyota and, Camry. And then go to her friend and be like, what kind of car does she drive? This Toyota is your Camry. car. That's, like, Is this your car? Yeah, that's your no, car. No, no, it's like... It, Bullshit. This is not your car on the video. I'm pretty sure a 16-year-old yeah. would probably, like, when presented with that, probably break, too. And actually, like, they could have fucking known this shit, like, months earlier. Yes, easily. Shitty-ass detective work. 
It was a known hangout spot for teenagers. It was located about 45 minutes away, just barely across the border into Pennsylvania. It was down this kind of old country road that nobody ever went country on. Road. And so Sheila drives the car 45 minutes. She crosses into Pennsylvania. She finds the turn onto this old road. They drive down it a little ways until they're pretty far away from the highway, at which point Sheila pulls off the road onto the grass, parks the car. The three girls get out and they walk past the car a little ways down the path to a clearing on the right. There was a hill that went up on the right and they would kind of sit on this hill looking downhill and that would be where they would smoke. And so the three girls, they sit down, they're all next to each other facing downhill. They're not facing each other. And Sheila, who was sitting all the way to the right with the car being over to the left, she pulls out the marijuana joint and she's about to light it but she realizes she does not have a lighter. And so she asks Rachel and Skylar if they have a lighter and they both pat themselves down, they're checking themselves, they don't have a lighter. And then Sheila says to Skylar, who's all the way to the left of the way they're sitting, so Skylar is closest to the car, she asks Skylar, hey, can you go in the car and get the lighter that I know is in there? And Skylar said, no problem. So Skylar, she stands up and she turns, her back is to her two friends. And as soon as she starts walking, what she would have heard is the sound of her two friends standing up as well, and then loudly saying, one, two, three. And on three, Skylar would have felt two knives being plunged into her back by oh, Rachel and by Sheila. In a panic, I Skylar fucking does not remember even hearing turn around. This she just starts taking off running towards the car, and she manages to run away from her attackers. But because of her grievous injuries in her back, she eventually slows down, at which point Sheila tackles her from behind. She gets her on the ground. She pins her on her back. And Sheila is trying to stab Skylar, but Skylar is doing her best to keep the knife off of her. But at some point, Rachel comes running up beside them. And between Rachel and Sheila, they manage to hold Skylar's hands down, at which point Sheila and Rachel began taking turns, stabbing her in the chest and in the neck. The whole time Skylar is trying to defend herself, but it's impossible with these two on top of her. And at some point she just kind of gives up and she says, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to me? But they don't give her a reason. They just keep on going. And eventually Rachel stops stabbing Skylar, but Sheila doesn't. Sheila keeps on going until quote, her neck stopped making gurgling sounds. And then once Skylar went still, Damn. Sheila stood up like it was nothing, and she and Rachel just walked away from her Are body. Are these the two bitches that did this because they said that fucking Slenderman told them to do it? I No, that girl, the girl that got stabbed in that lived. Oh, okay. I remember I thought, that. I thought they had killed somebody like nearby, and they were like, oh, Slenderman told us to do it. I thought I heard about that. They this seem around the same age. 2012, so it's within the time frame, but I don't think, I don't think so. Car. They went around to the trunk of the car, they opened it up, and inside was shovels, bleach, trash bags, rags. They had brought along a kill kit because they knew what they were going to do this night. And so they start by cleaning themselves off, they get the blood off of them and off of their weapons, and then they take the shovels and they walk a little ways off of the road, kind of into the woods, and they try to dig a grave, but it would turn out the ground was too hard. And so they abandon the grave idea and just grab Skylar's lifeless body and drag it just about six feet off of the the road and kind of chuck it against a log and then they threw boulders and sticks and anything they could on top of her body they don't know if she's still alive at this point so they're potentially dealing the fatal blow with these rocks and logs they cover her up until she's totally obscured and then the two girls just walk back up they grab their shovels they grab their rags their bleach they put it back in the trunk they hop in their car and they drive away it would turn out rachel and sheila had been planning this for months the reason they didn't like Skylar anymore, and apparently it wasn't enough to just be mean to her and not include her in things. They actually needed to kill her. And so the entire what night the that they went out and snuck out, that was all planned. They knew Skylar did not want to come out and sneak out with them because they knew she was upset with them. And so they said whatever they had to say to convince her to leave her house and sneak out with them. And so she did, she snuck out. And when she got in that car, Sheila and Rachel had their knives already in their front pocket of their sweatshirt, ready to go. And on their ride to this spot in Pennsylvania, Sheila and Rachel acted like, oh, let's just go to this spot and smoke. When in reality, this was planned too. They wanted to make sure they were far away from Morgantown when they Jeez. killed Skylar. 
And so when they got there and they walked down to their spot to actually begin smoking, Sheila and Rachel had intentionally not brought lighters and Sheila had left a lighter in the car specifically so she could ask Skylar to go get it. Because the plan was, as soon as Skylar gets up to get that lighter and her back is to us, Sheila and Rachel had promised each other that they would count to three and then attack her. Ultimately, Rachel would be sentenced to 30 years in prison, but she'll be eligible for parole in 2023. And Sheila would be sentenced to life in prison, but she would also be eligible for parole in 2028. During their trials, Rachel was very remorseful and even gave an apology to Skylar's parents during the sentencing phase. Sheila, on the other hand, smirked during her trial. For most of the time, she was smiling and totally making light of it. She said she didn't do it. She was totally not remorseful and she did not offer an apology to Skylar's parents. She did, however, leave an unbelievably cruel message on Twitter. In March of 2013, when the police came out and officially said, we have identified the remains in the forest in Pennsylvania as belonging to Skylar niece, when that announcement was made, just a couple of days later, Sheila tweeted, we really did go on three. Sheila was arrested one month later. So that's gonna do it guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please tell the like button. You're going to upload three, four, even yeah. five times a week on your YouTube channel and then drop it down to two or three times a week and then one or two times a week and then abruptly just go absent for three weeks straight. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannels and hats and sweatshirts and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballin.com. If you want to learn about upcoming deals and promotions for our shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. The username is shopmrballin. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username is the same for both platforms. It's just Mr. Ballin. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my my username is also Mr. Ballin. We also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts, where we post random short videos and lost episodes. We also have a Facebook page just called Mr. Ballin, where we post condensed versions of the longer episodes you see on YouTube. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. Jesus. And that kind of shit is why we should have the death penalty children. Especially for that one girl, Sheila. Yep. She, like, no remorse whatsoever. Yeah, I'm speaking no. specifically for her. Like, I would maybe get, a, like, let the other uh, one get away with life in prison or whatever. Life in prison or with, uh, I, I would say potentially paroled if you know she takes strides to better herself I don't, and the parents forgive her because that's that's yeah, the one that's thing, the one me. thing like the, the, the parents are forgiving are forgiving of her yeah and she is truly remorseful and sorry for what she has done and has learned from this experience but you can never be sure no you can't you can never but, be sure she's not just faking the remorse but but again i am like reasonable doubt the only reason that i kind of like feel like maybe i could see her serving time and then getting parole is the fact that she did like you can tell her conscience got to her and that's why she freaked out and went and told them what happens basically like that fact that she ratted out herself and the other girl basically like is the only reason i would maybe consider her eventually getting a chance at a new life after prison or whatever you know yeah Maybe. But that other girl, fuck her. They should just yeah. put a fucking bullet in her. Sheila, well... I don't give a shit if she was underage when she did it I would waste not. a bullet, man. You know what I'd do? I'd go down by a length of rope, and that way I could reuse it. That's mm. that's the one thing. I, I People... If we're talking the death penalty, people who truly deserve the, like, the iron price, as they say, I would say either... like The cheapest options are... A length of rope or a bullet. I, I mean, to say, an extent, like, if I, I'm still under the, uh, you should have exactly done to you what you did to the other person, unless you were a serial killer, in which case, obviously, that can't 
be one for one because you can't take as much punishment as you dealt out to multiple people. This is true. But like in this case, like I mean, I feel like they should chain her to a fucking thing and stab her a bunch of times until she bleeds out. Like that that I would say is probably a bit much because of the fact that I mean everybody fucking says that but that's just fucking retribution in my opinion that's how retribution should work I know the fact that you're putting like that on other people that like haven't done anything before like that possibly you know like basically someone has to play an executioner in that situation and they have to be okay with like fucking doing horrible things to people that did horrible things to other people but and then they have to also be okay with like not like fucking doing that to people who don't deserve it but at the same time like i kind of feel like having that be a job has the potential to possibly serve as both a deterrent to people who would do horrible things to other people because they think well if they catch me they're going to do the same thing to me but also if there was somebody who was just like, I just got to kill somebody. I just need to kill somebody. Hey, we have a job for you. Like, you know, I don't know. But I would fucking do it. Like, if someone asked me, like, I I don't know what it is with my brain. I'm probably fucked up. I would never kill someone who didn't do anything to somebody. But that bitch right there that stabbed that other girl that did not deserve it for no reason, I would gladly fucking... Like, I'm sure you probably can't put that on YouTube, but... <laughs> Like, hire me. I'll do it. <laughs> I just believe in, like, whenever you have someone that, un like, and I'm not saying every single person convicted of, like, you know, a crime and stuff. When we have nothing but just evidence and witness statements to say that someone did something, then, yeah, life in prison, like, long sentence in prison, whatever. Like, you know, we can't be 100%. This bitch posted, yeah, we really went on three on Twitter and fucking smirked in the courtroom. Fucking fill her with holes. Like, do the same shit she did to that girl that did not fucking deserve that. Like, that's my opinion on that kind of shit. And you can call me fucked up if you want to, but that's just how I feel about it. My personal moral compass doesn't really grasp eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Like, I don't really subscribe to that like a lot of people do. I That's one of the main reasons I fucking hate The Last of Us too, because that's the whole thing they're trying to do is like, oh, revenge isn't the answer. It's like, revenge is sometimes the fucking answer. <laughs> like, well, Tim and Kennedy. I mean, I'll, another thing too is like fucking like fathers whose daughters got fucking like sexually assaulted and murdered there's your executioner, man. Like they're probably almost 99% of the time going to be okay with gladly taking out whoever did that to their oh, daughter. There's, there's people I, I've like, I would gladly, uh, like a lot of boyfriends or husbands whose significant others got assaulted in the same way. would probably 99% of the time be okay with also playing executioner in that situation. Yeah, I could see it. It's like, they're all like death penalties inhumane. And I'm like, so is what they fucking did to other people. Like, I'd say the death penalty is only inhumane if it is if it causes, like inhumane. I that makes us like less than human if we do that to people. Yeah, but they are already less than human, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> well, they I would already say, put themselves there. I would say the biggest thing with me is I would put the death penalty, uh, cruel and unusual punishment. You know, that's inhumane. I, that's why I would say something like the length of rope or or a bullet to the head would be the most humane way to do it. Because I just think it's completely inappropriate that people who cause unimaginable suffering to innocent people get away with quick deaths. Like, I just think that's fucked up. Well, like it makes me mad that people get away with dying quickly and painlessly after causing unimaginable suffering on others. Well, it just shows that you're the bigger person. I mean, I don't care about being the bigger person in that situation. I do. Fuck those people. Because I, I, I don't want to go down the road that it's basically the Batman logic. I don't want to be the same as them. I don't want to be I, I like to the same as them by I, committing the same acts. Yeah, no. I like Batman, and I respect the hell out of his, like, no-kill policies and the new stuff. And I think it's an interesting character. But I would not be that Batman. Like... It, 
I would shoot the Joker. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. Like I said, I don't like the idea of Batman just fucking going off and shooting people and stuff because I think it's less interesting in terms of the comics and stuff, you know? But I just know me personally, I couldn't be Bruce Wayne in Arkham or any of those other things. I Once Joker was like, kill me so I don't kill all these other people, I would be like, okay. <laughs> That's just me, you know? All right. Me personally, I don't know. Like, just... I, I feel like it's just bullshit that people cause unimaginable suffering to others and get to die without pain. Like, I, I hate it. I don't like it. Well, as far as I'm concerned, most people who are, you know, rapists, uh, at least they get the blow-up doll treatment in uh, prisons. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's more than fair. And I think it should be like that for every single one of them. Uh, because, and I'm not talking like, like, you know, 19 year old boy hooks up with a 17 year old girl and yeah. they're in a relationship and all that. That's, that's nothing. What I'm talking about is like the 35 year old man basically like soliciting a 15, 16 year old. Yeah. You deserve or even it. a 35 year old man that drugs another full uh, that, woman yeah. or something like yeah. that. Yeah. You, know. you know, drugs and does all that. Yeah. They deserve they deserve to be turned into a, into a blow-up doll in prison. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that that does happen a lot to those bastards. But anyway... I mean, like, that that's basically the same thing. It's like you, you're saying, like, the bigger man thing, you know? It's but, like, but the bigger man, what I mean by that is literally, like, at the mercy of the justice system. And I hate to say it, but... That's something so those that, guys aren't really at the mercy of the justice system at that point. They're at the mercy of other inmates. Which so. which are in the justice system. I guess so. The justice system putting them into the system itself and thus making them liable to be to have that done to them. I, in all honesty, I don't really have a problem with that 100%. But... I would say that would be like that would be the only thing that I would say, you know, me being the bigger man, you know, be like it's out of my hands, it's out of my control. <laughs> and sort of like how Batman was in that one robot chicken thing when the courts decided on the death penalty for the Joker, uh, when the judge was just like guilty, death penalty. Uh, Batman was behind the Joker, be like, sorry man, it's out of my hands. Yeah, I oh, mean, and. Yeah, I guess that's sort of being seen as passing the buck, but whatever. Anyway, we've ranted and raved on this enough. Uh, this was Mr. Ballin. These teens have a terrifying secret. Mature audiences only. Uh, be sure to check out more from Mr. Ballin by clicking his name in the title of the video. Puts out new videos every single week. And uh, yeah, uh, if you all want to see more from us, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, leave a like on the video. It helps us out a whole hell of a lot. And until next time, I'm Nate. I'm Nick. See you later, everybody. Bye-bye.